We've labeled the entire unit modernism, a term that now seems a little strange since modernist art really comes to an end in the mid to late 20th century. I'm not going to linger on this slide. I'm really just including it for review purposes. But you do need to know that the early 20th century was a time of great political, intellectual, and artistic upheaval. World War I revealed the savage underbelly of technology and dashed hopes that the human race was progressing steadily toward greater peace and prosperity. Nietzsche proclaimed that God was dead. Marx proclaimed that capitalism was ripe for destruction. Freud proclaimed that our dreams revealed our true inner selves, and it was all about sex. In the world of art, we're going to encounter a bewildering list of isms, many of which are listed on this slide. Don't worry about memorizing all of these yet, although you'll need to eventually. For now, just realize that art in general moves away from illusionism to abstraction as artists seek to use color, line, shape, and composition to convey a deeper reality. You'll notice that once again, I'm borrowing and inserting summary slides. I think you'll find them useful as you try to review all these isms. What we're really looking at, starting with the screen, which you just saw, and the paintings I'm about to show you, are different branches of expressionism. Impressionists tried to capture a fleeting visual reality. Expressionists, really starting with the post-impressionists, tried to capture emotional reality. The primary tools they used were brilliant, even jarring colors thick textured paint or impasto, and strong line, including black outlines. Fauvism was a very brief but influential movement of French artists who actually rejected the fin de siècle despair and symbolist literary pretensions. They tried to return to what they saw as Impressionism's joyful embrace of nature while retaining post-Impressionism's expressive use of color. And in fact, this painting is entitled The Joy of Life by the founder and leader of the Fauves, Henri Matisse. The painting is filled with references to past masterpieces. Can you identify any of these? Well, we see shout outs to pastoral scenes of Venetian -like, Venetians like Titian, Angra's sensuous long backed nudes, Monet's luncheon in the grass, maybe even cave paintings. Like Cezanne, Matisse employs shifting perspectives. He uses landscape more as a stage than as a realistic setting. Trees feature essentially as curtains. The painting is imbued with sensuality, and it's high, that's heightened by those pulled, pure colors, high saturation, if you remember that term. Picasso, by the way, was very jealous when he saw this painting. There was a big rivalry between Matisse and Picasso, and it was after he saw this painting that Picasso began working on his Demoiselle d'Avignon. Basically, it was an exercise in one-upmanship, as we will see soon, a pretty successful exercise. Here again, we see color liberated from descriptive reality. Not even Parisian women had green noses. Again, like Cezanne, Matisse uses color patches, advancing warm colors and receding cool colors to create a perception of depth while still embracing and emphasizing the essentially two-dimensional quality of painting. Again, I know I keep harking this modernism was often about making the act of painting explicit. Here are two more characteristic Matisse paintings. Note the expressive use of bold color, what his critics call an unfinished look to his canvas, and those strong, obvious lines, the boldly outlined figures. Okay, now that I've introduced Matisse, let's hear from a student presenter. Just a few additional points. You learned from your reading why Matisse was so fascinated with goldfish. Remember that, hint. Matisse was also fascinated with patterns, especially textile patterns. You saw this in our required work. Here are a couple more examples. The odalisque on the left was also painted after Matisse traveled to North Africa. Matisse had an extensive private fabric collection. You see an example from North Africa in the upper, excuse me, in the upper left. Toward the end of his life, he began creating art with patterned cutouts. Here's an example on the right. Duran was a co-founding Fauve artist who didn't make our cut. I'm including some of his work because, as you guessed it, I, he's one of my personal favorites. At any rate, you might even be asked to attribute a Duran painting to the Fauves based on his highly saturated expressive colors and joyful spirit. Duran was also very important to the history of art because he collected African art, and he introduced his collection of fang masks to Matisse, and even more significantly to Picasso. 
Uh, Durant's The Dance reveals the influence of the African art collection. The wildly vibrant colors are phobist, of course, but the rest of the painting references African art through African masks, primitive body painting, and curvy forms that reflect ancient stylized female figurines. Stay tuned. Another prominent faux painter who doesn't show up in your textbook is Georges Brouault. Uh, he was a devout Catholic who painted many religious scenes. This is probably his most famous painting. Art historians speculate that the king is King David, but we don't know for sure. Well, I hope you enjoyed that brief glimpse of the cheerful wild beasts or fauves, because now we're moving east and the outlook, political, philosophical, and artistic, becomes grimmer. By the beginning of the 20th century, the old authorities in Germany, king and church, were under challenge from science and from democratic politics. In Germany, though, an autocratic regime had held on to power. Late and rapid industrialization had created considerable social dislocation, and a string of German philosophers pronounced the end of religion, of history, and of the established order. German artists were especially influenced by the philosopher Nietzsche, who called for a deconstruction of morals, for somehow moving beyond good and evil. Here's, some, here's a passage, part of a passage from Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra, that gave Die Brücke its name. Man is a rope stretched between the animal and the superman, a rope over an abyss, a dangerous crossing, a dangerous wayfaring, a dangerous looking back, a dangerous trembling and halting. Kirchner was the leader of the bridge crossers who rejected conventional morality. Like all of the German expressionists, he chose jarring, dissonant colors. I'm reminded a little of mannerist artists who also sought to unsettle their viewers with strange combinations of tertiary colors. You can also see that Kirchner was influenced by Munch. He's interested in psychological angst, in the individual's alienation from society, even in a crowd, and in the dangerous, unsettling power of women. The German expressionists were more likely than the Fauves to paint urban scenes, and the frenetic but isolated life of city dwellers is a constant theme in their work. They deeply admired Van Gogh and often imitated his deep, swirling brushstrokes. They also employed angular lines, kind of crude lines, again reflecting the sharpness and dangers of urban life. Here are a few other paintings by Kirchner that capture some of these same elements. Aggressive, jarring color, and the objectification of women, to use a fe feminist term. De Brugge dissolved in 1913, partly because other members thought Kirchner was too bossy. The outbreak of World War I also disrupted German artistic life, but Kirchner produced one of his most famous paintings and our required work after De Brugge dissolved. So let's hear the story from a student presenter. Der Blauwriter was formed in 1911 in Munich as a loose association of painters led by Russian immigrant Vasily Kandinsky and German native Franz Marc. They shared an interest in abstract forms and in prismatic colors, that is, the colors of the rainbow, which they felt had spiritual values that could counteract the corruption and materialism of their age. Note again this unifying theme, color has a message beyond the obvious. Kandinsky wrote 20 years later that the name Blue Rider emerged from Marx's, Marx's enthusiasm for horses and his own love of riders, combined with a shared love of the color blue, although they actually attach different significance to blue. For Kandinsky, blue is the color of spirituality, and the darker the blue, the more it awakens human desire for the eternal. The horse was also a prominent subject in Marx's work, which centered on animals as symbols of rebirth. Kandinsky is very important to the art history world, to the to art history, excuse me, because he is really the first modern artist to move entirely into the world of the abstract. So let's hear from a student presenter about this rather startling work. You may well have heard this already, but Kandinsky was especially influenced by what he saw as the perfect abstract art, music. Kandinsky sought to create image-free art that spoke directly to the senses, and he thought music did the same thing. In fact, most of his works bear titles, such as composition or improvisation. 
While Kandinsky's paintings lack clear representational figures, they do all seem to capture a kind of cosmic conflict. Kandinsky was fascinated, for example, by the story of the flood in Genesis, by the apocalypse described in the book of Revelation. He also formed a close friendship with Arnold Schoenberg, a musician who was trying to work outside the traditional musical scale, more bridge crossing. Uh, he developed his own 12-tone scale and composed all of his works using that scale. So I found a YouTube video that juxtaposes Kandinsky's paintings with Schoenberg's music, and here's a very brief clip. Uh, if you enjoy it, and I confess I'm a little too traditional to be a big Schoenberg fan, feel free to watch the entire video, which is, again, wonderfully weird. Kandinsky's paintings are very distinctive, which I'm guessing makes them tempting choices for an attribution question. Franz Marc was another member of the Blue Rider School and is in fact most famous for his paintings of blue horses. Uh, he is another painter who's dropped off the list and another painter I'm going to show you anyway because I love his art. Like Kandinsky, Marc loved the expressive power of color. You'll note, by the way, that the Blue Rider colors are much less jarring and murky, more brighter, higher value, more saturated, although like the bridge paintings, they are bright and relatively pure in hue. Mark also believed that colors had symbolic meaning. He saw blue as the masculine principle. Yellow was the feminine principle, and red represented brutal, heavy matter. The pure colors notwithstanding, this is a violent painting. Remember that in 1913, World War I was threatening, and it would break out in just a year. These animals seem to be trapped in the face of the coming catastrophe soon to be shattered by man's inhumanity. And indeed, Mark would die in the war, ending his brilliant career much too soon. Okay, here's one of Mark's beautiful blue horses paintings. We had a large print of this work hanging on our family room wall when I was a kid, and I loved its brilliant colors and its horses. I wanted to walk into this painting, and I still do. So here are some more Mark animal pictures. I haven't talked about cubism yet, next lecture, but the way that Mark breaks animals into different surface planes shows the strong influence of Picasso and Brock. Remember that a lot of the works we'll be showing, I sort of arbitrarily put them into categories, but they are uh, being produced simultaneously with a lot of mutual influence among artists. The brilliant colors, however, are pure blue rider, as we'll see, particularly the early Cubist works are often in muted browns and blacks. And with that, we'll move on to Cubism and perhaps the greatest giant of the 20th century, Pablo Picasso.